Welcome to a journey through the history of art. We will travel along a timeline from the caves to the 19th century. My name is Dr. Jean Ouellette. Let's begin by making the familiar unfamiliar. Although the Renaissance proudly named and proclaimed itself as the rebirth of classicism, the Baroque period was named, like most art historical periods, much later in the middle of the 18th century. Baroque is a word that meant a bizarre taste that did not conform to the rules of classicism. However, art history today does not make anachronistic judgments, but views art in its original cultural context in order to understand its role in society and the task assigned to the artist by society. The Baroque culture of the 17th century was the scene of great power struggles between kings and popes, between Catholics and Protestants, as modern nations organized under secular control began to emerge, and as competing religious doctrines attempted to secure adherence. The Baroque artists had a variety of roles to play, depending upon their location and upon who their client was. Baroque art needs to be defined nation by nation in order to demonstrate the wide range of cultural needs. First stop, Italy, home base for the Roman Catholic or Universal Church, an institution under siege from Protestant charges of corruption. The task of the artist working for the church was to present a purified and fundamental religion now under the sway of Spanish control after the sack of Rome in 1527. The Spanish attitude towards religion was quite different from the rational classicism that had filtered into religion in Italy. Under Spanish rule, religion was purged of logic and became mystical and highly emotional, and art was stripped of any lingering pagan elements. If the southern European nation of Italy and the northern nation of France have anything in common, it is that both used art frankly and forcefully as propaganda. Whether working under the Catholic Church, especially in Rome, or the French king, the artist was essentially a propagandist and an advertiser for a set of beliefs. The Baroque artist worked for centers of power, if they were prominent and sought after superstars. Ironically, lesser-known artists may have had more latitude, more freedom from censorship and control. In Italy, the Council of Trent of 1557 knew that the visual arts were a powerful tool for communication and the church expected artists to draw the spectator into the emotional heart of religion. In 1685, Andrea Pozio painted the ceiling of St. Ignacio in Rome. The viewer, gazing rapidly upward, is drawn to the heavens. The trompe l'oeil approach makes the actual architecture of the building open to the sky, revealing figures floating towards the light, through the clouds, towards infinity. This blurring of the boundaries between illusion and reality can also be seen in Gian Lorenzo Bernini's The Ecstasy of St. Teresa and the Coronaro Chapel of 1647-52. A concetta or concept showing a moment of religious bliss and the life of a mystic saint. The concept is that we, the viewers, are in a theater, sitting in boxes, watching a beautiful male angel piercing a female saint with a long golden arrow. To the modern eye, there is something voyeuristically creepy about the male members of the Coronaro family nearly falling out of their theater boxes gawking at the woman whose garments were stirring with the force of her emotions and whose face is tilted back, mouth open, eyes closed. Even a marble skeleton on the floor below is involved in religious scopophilia. One of the best examples of a Baroque artist was almost forgotten by art historians. Artemisia Gentileschi, like all artists who were women, had to wait until the feminist movement of the 1970s to find her rightful place in history. During a time when women were excluded from the visual arts, Gentileschi was allowed to be trained as a painter only because her father, Eusio, was her teacher. Despite her gender, however, Gentileschi found clients and patrons who were eager to buy her dramatic works of art. Most famous is her series on the life of a hero from the Bible, Judith. When compared with her male colleagues, Gentileschi's dramatic painting of Judith beheading her enemy, Holofernes, 
is riveting and powerful, far more realistic and bloody than the renditions of other artists. Taking advantage of the invader's weakness for pretty women, Judith got him drunk and, with the help of her maid, attacked Holofernes. This theme of beheading and Gentileschi's rendition was so popular that there were two versions. The next scenes of the story, told by Baroque Candlelight, depict the suspenseful aftermath. As an example of Baroque artists, the art of Gentileschi had it all, drama and suspense, staged in an in-your-face theatrical manner taking advantage of exciting diagonals, suspenseful obscurity, animus chiaroscuro, all the hallmarks of the Baroque, to tell a powerful story of bravery. The viewer is engaged and involved, horrified at the struggle between the doomed man beset by two determined women. Judith saved her people through her bravery, and it could be argued that Gentileschi created one of the most exciting versions of the story that seems tailor-made for the tastes of the Baroque culture. <laughs>